Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You are about to listen to an episode of the Audio Signals Podcast with Marco Cappelli. In this new season, Audio Signals is repositioning its antennas, focusing not just on the stories, but on the storytellers. In our modern hybrid analog digital society, the art of storytelling has never been more vital or displayed such a diverse array of forms. Recognizing this, our conversations will spotlight the narrators, providing a unique exploration into the minds behind the narratives. From authors to podcasters, visual artists to songwriters, and everything in between, we will engage with all who contribute to this extraordinary tapestry of human experience. We are all made of stories after all. Hello everybody, this is Marco Ciappelli. Welcome to another episode of Audio Signal Podcast. For those of you that have been listening to my latest episodes, you know I've repositioned the antennas to capture stories that are focused not just on the stories themselves, but also on the storytellers, which are the one that uh, create the story in their mind and the, the medium, the medium that they use to share their story may be different. So it's not just a book, it can be a movie, it can be any piece of art. And if you know me, you know I love music, uh, any kind of music, literally. And uh, I'm excited today that we're going to talk about songwriting and writing music, recording music uh, with uh, with my guest today, which is Drew Ryder-Smith, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, welcome so, to the show, Drew. Yeah, Marco, thanks so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, that, this is going to be fun and exciting and kind of like uh, dig back a little bit in uh, in where your passion for, for what you do nowadays came from. So, uh, Let's let's start with that. Uh, who is Drew? <laughs> oh well, that's uh, that's pretty complicated. But I can <laughs> I can tell you where I started. That's that and, that's and where I'm function. at now. <laughs> um, man, I so I grew up in Southern Middle Tennessee, uh, which is you know it turned out to be a, a huge blessing uh, because I didn't have to move all the way across the country to Nashville like you know so many of my peers did. Uh, so many of them are so far away from home and uh, I'm an hour and a half from, from my entire family, man. So that, that's been, that's been really great. I I feel like it it also helped me transition into Nashville uh, a a little better than, than most people. Um, Well, it wasn't as scary for me, but I, I grew up with, um, with a mom and dad that loved, that loved music and they loved all kinds of music and lots of different artists and lots of different genres. And I grew up on, you know, stuff from the singer songwriter stuff like Steve Earle and John Prine, uh, some Towns Van Zandt, things like that to, you know, Guns N' Roses and, uh, uh Nirvana and then back to Merle Haggard and Dolly Parton, Don Williams, people like that. So, and, and everything in between, man, the, the California country stuff like the Eagles and Jackson Brown and Don Henley and those guys. So it's a really, um, really interesting mashup of, of different uh, artists and bands and musical styles. And I just, I fell in love with music, uh, you know, so young. And uh, I just, I felt like, you know, it was, um, it was always in my bones everyone on my mother's side uh of my family played and sang and uh my father's side they were all farmers and mechanics um so i i feel like i got about 50 percent of that in my blood i don't know what the rest of it is man because i don't know anything about cars or farming so <laughs> well you gotta you gotta pick something and 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 the good news is when you let i think your passion drive you it's hard to go wrong with that. Uh, you need a little bit of luck in life, of course. Yeah. 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 But uh, but I'm a big fan of listening to to your heart. So uh, did you pick up like an instrument right away, or because I love music, but I you know I wouldn't get on stage with my guitar or keyboard even if I play around a little bit. But I do love music. I love. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, the, some of the bands. Are, 
you know, I, I was born in 1969, so the 70s, 80s, uh, Guns N' Roses seen them, I think, six times. Right. Wow! Yeah, so, man. yeah. <laughs> so you know that that's that's something that I share. The Eagles, uh, a lot of. I'm not like a big country guy coming from Italy. Yeah. The country is not a big thing over there. Sure. But uh, but I appreciate every kind of music. So t tell me about like, did you pick up an instrument and and you'd said mm, this is it? I really love it. Yeah, yeah. When I was about ten, I I got serious about uh, playing guitar. I had guitars growing up, um, but when I when I turned about 10, that was when I got really turned on to it and got really serious. And by about uh, 12 or so, that was when I started you know, writing things down in notebooks, that sort of thing. It's when I got really interested in, in writing songs. And I've, uh, I've not improved any at all <laughs> since 12 years old, I don't feel like. But I just keep, just keep showing up. All right. Well, that that's the thing. If it comes natural, that's uh, that's a good thing, you know. You yeah. Know? A lot of people are really good, technically speaking, and other people are really good in in putting something out there. I, I don't know if you agree with that, but you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, some musicians <laughs> yeah. are wow. Technically, you are unbelievable, but I kind of don't feel it. <laughs> yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So um, tell me about the, the songwriting process, because, uh, I mean, obviously writing music, it's, it's also a way to tell a story. So we're going to go there, too. But let's start with the writing itself, because a lot of people, they get other other writers thoughts and then they sing that or somebody in the band is not necessarily not everybody participated to the composition of of the song. Right. So you find yourself playing somebody else's music, singing somebody else's song. But when you write your own, it's a, it's a different story. So how do you do that? What's the process there? Man, my process is, I mean, for years I wrote by myself until I moved to Nashville. And, and when you move to Nashville, you, you kind of end up in a way, and not in a negative way at all, but in a way you're kind of forced into co-writing with other people, which is a, uh, it's a really great thing. I mean, I, I really love it. I love co-writing. I've always loved co-writing and have become, you know, I, I came to love it much more than just sitting down and writing by myself so much so that there was a long period of time when I never wrote anything by myself. I've saved everything for my co-writes. So, you know, the process is that you, you show up with one or two other guys in a room usually guys that, you know, are also in publishing deals and, um, and you connect and you, you sit down and you throw around ideas for half an hour or so. And once you land on one that everyone unanimously, uh, feels like is, is a good choice for the day, then, you know, you just dive into it. A lot of people ask about, you know, do the lyrics or the music come first? And that's a common question that I get. And yeah, me, that's they, my question too. So go for yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, usually it's, it's just the idea first. And then, you know, from there, if you've got, if your idea is a line, I mean, we'll just, this is super simple, but like Mary had a little lamb. If that's your hook, if that's what you're going with, if that's your title. You know, that has a cadence to it. Mary had a little lamb. And so, you know, to say those words, whether aloud or in your mind, you kind of feel that cadence. And that cadence, a lot of times, uh, will kind of lead you into a melody uh, and, a, and a rhythm. So for me, it all just kind of shows up at the same time. And I, you know, tweak things as I go. I tweak things musically just like I do, you know, lyrically. Hmm. But but it does start with the with the song, with the words first. With the idea, well, with the idea. The idea, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I never sit down and write out a verse or write out a chorus and then go, okay, how do I put music to this? Got it. Cool. To me, that always felt too much like poetry. Hmm. That is poetry. Right? Yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah, it's just poetry. And and I've never felt like I was much of a poet. Um, so 
yeah for for me I, they all it all kind of comes together all at once and so that's cool. it's a great experience though absolutely when you write something and you, you usually are the hardest critique of yourself too always right yeah i mean i'm really bad to myself man <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to give advice to other people and say, hey, man, that's great. Great piece you just wrote there. And then you look at yours, you're like, you know, it's kind of like that imposter yeah. syndrome. But you had yeah. good, good success. You, you've been touring. You've been playing, writing for other people. So tell me when it became a business for you. When did you say, hey, this is I can make a living out of this? And I, you know, I never really did. I still don't think that. I'm still trying to figure out if I can make a living out of this. But I think it was probably 2008. I was still working a regular job, and and um, but I was playing a ton, and I was starting to travel to play. And my boss called me one night and said, "Man, you know, you're you're really into this music thing, and it's it's going really well. Seems to be going really well." And I think you've just got to, I think you just got to take off and just do it, man. You just, you know, I, I think you got to dive in head first. And, and, uh, he said, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you're not going to be able to just kind of halfway do until something happens. You're going to have to, you're going to have to stop this regular job thing and go out there and sweat and, and, uh, you know, wonder how you're going to pay your bills for a while and, you know, kind of bleed for it. But I think that's what you got to do. And he said, you know, if it doesn't work out, man, he said, you go try for a while. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work out, come back. And, you know, you've always got a job, but, uh, luckily I never had to do that. So it was, you know, honestly, it, it was, it was someone else that kind of coerced me, uh, and, and kind of gave me a, a little push to do it. Um, because without that, I think eventually I would have done it myself. I would have eventually gotten to the point where I said, okay, this is, this is getting to be too much, you know, working full time and trying to play these gigs and, you know, trying to write songs with other people. And, you know, it would have either been that, or I would have eventually gotten to the point where I said, okay, you know, I think I can do well enough uh, with, without a full-time job, I think I can make this the full-time job, but it certainly wouldn't have been, it certainly wouldn't have been then. I don't think it would have even been that year, you know? And so, uh, sometimes you need a little bit of help and I've learned to accept that, <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to accept it sometimes, but I, I have learned that, you know, a little nudge from somebody sometimes can really change your life. And, and in that, in that scenario, it certainly did. Well, and it's great to have a boss like that. It wasn't even somebody in the music industry. I'm assuming it was another, no, no, another no, no. Job, he, didn't, so. he didn't know anything about about music or the music business. But he the the unique thing about him was that years ago he had played for the Oakland Raiders. He did a couple of seasons with them. And he, uh, I think, he blew out you know one of his knees, got an operation, uh, did rehab for that. Got back on the field, was killing it, and then blew out the other knee. Right. And uh, and he at that point he said, "Okay, that's I think that's probably going to be the end of this NFL career." But the the guy understood the one in a million chance. You yeah. know, he he got that, and so that was a that was a unique position for him, and that. So it ended up being a unique position for me is that I could hear it from a guy that actually went out there and, and did that one in a million job. And, uh, you know, again, due to, due to injuries, he, he wasn't able to live it for very long, but, but man, he got to do it. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a huge thing. So it was much more believable coming from him than, you know, if, if uncle Larry would have called me or something, <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> You, you you thought he was much more objective maybe than than a family yeah. member or you know, a girlfriend or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but, for not, sure. But but he, he certainly did understand the struggle and say you got to give it a chance. That's that's pretty much it. Yeah. Have you uh, have you had some metaphor in speaking? I'm going to use a metaphor like injuries in in your initial career that you almost gave up. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I think the the hardest part for me is when I'm between publishing deals. Mm. You know, because you're you're going to sign usually a one to three year deal, but you you know there's an option at the end of each year. And so anytime I sign a new contract, I go, okay, well, I've got 364 more days before I'm potentially out of a job. You know, it's like the countdown starts immediately for me. Mm. And then the closer to that year mark that I get, you know, the more nervous I, I get about it. And uh, deals come and go. And that's just, I mean, that's just the way that it is. And and I think, you know, historically, those publishing deals have have always been that way they've been you know one to three years sometimes you'll get a five-year deal occasionally but you know most of them are, are a, a good average is about three years and i've i've learned from being in several publishing deals myself and then having so many friends in publishing deals three years is usually you know kind of your max uh, and everyone's ready for something different creatively at that point. So I think it's good that it cycles every three years, but it, it's still terrifying, you know, because right. you never know when that, that next deal is, is going to come or where it's going to come from. So it's, it's certainly not always easy. Uh, right. those, those would be my injuries, I guess, but those are the, <laughs> that's usually when I'm the closest to saying, okay, this might be, this might be the last one. But is it also one of those situations where it allows you to reset yourself and look back maybe inside and say, am I, am I writing the right stuff? Am I playing the things that I really like? I mean, it, it, does it give you an opportunity to rethink where you're going with, with your music? Uh, I, I would say yes, but mainly because... Um, you end up in different circles. You, for me, I kind of force myself into other circles that I'm not typically in because I, I'm looking for a job, you know? Right. And so, uh, and it's not one of those things where you set your sights on, you know, one, one company or one person and you go, okay, that's, that's a thing. And I'm going to hang out until they sign me. You know, you've got to have as many irons in the fire as possible. And so you have to open yourself up to other circles and you have to force yourself into other circles. And so that's kind of what it does for me. And as a result of being in different circles with different people and different styles and different backgrounds and all that, I, it changes my writing, mm. you know, to an extent. There's still a lot of me in there, but, you know, you're always picking things up from from other people. And that's one of the fun things about songwriting is you're constantly learning and you're constantly you know, taking pieces of other people, just like you're giving, you know, pieces of yourself. So in that way, yeah, yeah, it, it certainly changes what I'm yeah. doing. Yeah. I, I like that what you said that you have to put yourself out there and change the environment to get inspiration and challenges, right? So I'm curious to know what is that you find your inspiration the most. It, do you write about things that happen to you? Do you write about things that happen to others? Maybe you watch a movie, you read a book. I mean, what what is like your secret? all of those things? All of it. Yeah, yeah, all of those things. Um, I I <laughs> I tell this story occasionally. Um, I was at a Starbucks one morning. It's been years ago. I think I I yeah I was I was pretty fresh into my first publishing deal. And uh, I would stop at this Starbucks in Green Hills here in Nashville every morning. And I'd sit outside and, and smoke and drink my coffee before I went in. And so there's a, I go outside one day and, and sit down at one of the little tables and like the table next to me, there was a couple there that were breaking up. And so I was like, well, I mean, they're not being quiet about it. I didn't know they were, I didn't know they were going to break up. So it's, you know, I'm not eavesdropping. So, I, but I sat there and listened to the, <laughs> these people break up. And I think I probably, you know, I'm sure three or four different songs came out of that probably over the next, you know, couple of weeks or so, just from being in that energy and in that space. Right. So yeah, I'll pick it up anywhere I can get it, man. Newspaper, or eavesdropping, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I I guess you didn't credit them on the songwriting. That couple. I did not. 
No, they never they never know they are in three songs. They'll That's matter. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> I love I love that. I love that. Uh, listen, I, I know that you do other things. I have a few notes that that I have from from you and from um, looking at your website and your biography. You songwriting, musician, uh, but also engineer and producer. Now, I I'm in LA. I've been here for 20 plus years. So I've met a few musicians here. Some made it, some didn't, but they're still amazing. They play in the local, you know, pub down at the beach <laughs> in the South Bay. Yeah. And uh, and you wonder why they never did it. So there there are certain things that I feel like things have changed. That's where I'm going right now. You kind of need to be a little bit of a chameleon, but you also need to put yourself out there. And how did doing other things like you know being a producer? I think you have a a recording studio as well. You, you work yeah, there. Yeah. Well, you I, you, I think you just nailed it when you said chameleon. I I think that. Man, the ultimate guide to success is to be able to be a chameleon, you know, remain yourself, but be able to chameleon and in, in, into other into other situations. I, I came about the recording and the producing and all that completely by accident. The, the quick version of that is that um, I, I bought Pro Tools and, and had a, a friend of mine, IT guy, that built me a system specifically for it. This is years ago. I was in my first writing deal. And I got a mic and an interface and, you know, all the things. And I, I, I got that simply because I wanted to make better work tapes instead of just, you know, because at the time, I mean, we're talking like just 2010. So at the time, the, the best that was out there was, you know, outside of professional equipment, the best that we had available was, um, you know, little digital recorders. Because you nobody was really recording anything on their phone yet. It just didn't sound right. didn't sound like it does now. So I wanted to make, uh, but the digital recorders are a real pain because you had to carry around a USB cord and the batteries would die all the time, and because you'd forget to turn it off and just all this stuff, you know. And you'd have to file through, you know, all these different song files on there. And so uh, I thought, well, I'll get Pro Tools and that's uh, I'll make better work tapes that way and be more organized. And so it, I, I just fell in love with the process of recording. And it was really the curiosity of like, how do you make this sound better? Do I, you know, can I move over here or, oh, I can put the mic here and it sounds better? You know, things like that. Um, so. Yeah, man, that's kind of that's that's how I got started in that. And it just grew from there. It got it went way out of control, way off the rails, Marco. And years later, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, cutting records on other people and things like that. But it's it's really a ton of fun. And I'm so glad that it happened. But it that has allowed me just, you know, simply my curiosity has allowed me to, you know, kind of move in and out of different circles and different in a different situations and, but also be an asset in different ways, you know? So I, I mean, I had this last studio I, I had, um, on music row, there were, you know, a few different studios in there and, and, you know, the guys that I was renting space, uh, next to, you know, they all knew me as a songwriter, but then once I started renting out that space, they found out that I mix and that I record and I produce and all that. And so they go, Man, we we just cut these tracks over, you know, blah blah blah, and we need a mix like Thursday. <laughs> and, and this this guy just, you know, he he's got a family emergency or whatever. Can you mix it? And I go, yeah, you know. And and then they would just start pitching me their their demos to mix, you know. And so it's things like that. And through that, I meet other people that I'm not writing with. And so now I'm writing with that person, you know. So. It, man, being able to do more than w just one thing um, is if you can manage it well, then, you know, it's it's certainly uh, it, it certainly give you a leg up. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and it kind of if you keep it gravitating all around the same area, obviously, it, that's that's the key. You don't want to go do something completely different and out of your zone because that no, is not, not going to come back to you as a connection or an opportunity yeah it doesn't really do me any good to you know to sell ice cream 
as a side hustle, you know. Well, you may have got a good idea for a song, maybe. Two I mean, yeah, three. it could happen, and I do love ice cream. <laughs> there you go. That's your next song, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's you know to keep it all relative. I think is is the is the takeaway from that. Yeah. You know, and, and it's good for me too, man, because um, doing the artist thing, I, I, I love doing that. I love to perform. A lot of times when I'm performing, performing, I'm thinking about either mixing or producing or writing. And when I'm producing another artist, I'm thinking about I want I want to write more, you know. Right. And and when I'm, you know, when I'm mixing, I'm thinking about you know whatever. And it's um, it's kind of using you know these different parts of the brain, but it's all still musical. So I've been really blessed. Yeah, I I like that, and I I think a lot of people need to be more open for these things because if you you, you you never know where the inspiration is going to come from or the next opportunity. Yeah. And you said something, and I'm curious about the Nashville because first you said that when you get there, you got there, you had to start co-writing, almost like mm -hmm. if it's a it's a rule. <laughs> no, it's an yeah. unwritten yeah, yeah, rule, yeah. but you have to do it. And now yeah. you're talking about being on music row and collaborating with other people. So in my mind, I'm picturing this extremely collaborative environment. Instead of being competitive, yeah. it's it's collaborative, which may make a huge difference for an artist. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it, it's funny. I mean, people a lot of times will. will when they ask about it, they say, well, is it, you know, I guess it's really competitive there. And it's like, no, it's, it's really not, man. I mean, we, you would think that it would be, we all have the same goal. So you, you would think that we would all be trying to, but especially now with the ability to, to put, to distribute music on your own without a label and without anything else, you know, I, and as open as the world seems to, independent music it's to me it's just it's just not it's just not a competition but even before that man like it was it never felt like a competition as competitive as it got was you wanted to write a better song than the guys in the room next to you <laughs> you know which is but a good the, competition it just made you better it is yeah and and the worst that comes out of that is that they try to beat you the next day, you know? Yeah. And it's the same thing when I go to a writer's round, which I don't, I don't go to nearly as many as I, I should these days, but you know, to this day, man, even with the success that I've had, when I go to a writer's round and I, I hear somebody, you know, play a great song, it makes me want to go home and write something as good or better than that. Yeah. So it's, it, it inspires me in that way. Yeah, I love that. Uh, you mentioned nowadays you can pretty much do music and put it out there. So I know things have changed. I, I When I talk to authors, same thing. You don't necessarily need the record deal. You don't need the book deal. Yeah. You, you can go the other way around. Yeah. Go on TikTok, social media. I mean, we see a lot of stories of people that just became famous because of yeah. that. So I'm curious for you to know from you that you had an experience, let's say, prior to maybe what it is now. So maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago or more. Is the music industry, on your opinion, changed for the better in terms of opportunity for younger artists, independent? I don't, or, I don't or is, know, man. You have no idea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, Did man. Did it change I, you, though? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think so. I think I think it probably changed all of us in you know some shape, form, or fashion. Um, because it 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 was like all right for songwriters, and I've seen guys have this conversation. I've I've, I've not really been in this situation, but I have seen other guys in this situation where they go, okay, well, I'm supposed to write with with this guy on Tuesday. And he just signed a deal with Sony. So he's he's like the new kid on the block. But he's on Sony. It's a huge label, right? 
So there's a lot of promise there. So you'd be right. But then this guy over here, it's getting a million streams a month. He also wants to write on Tuesday. Mm. And I don't know what the Sony kid's going to do, but I know what this, this other, this independent guy is getting a million streams a month. I know what he's doing. Yep. So, you know, it changes, it changes things like that, man. Um, and it certainly changed the reaction of the labels and the reaction of artists as well now, because I mean, there's guys out there turning down deals because they're getting, you know, a million plus streams a month on Spotify. And so they, they get, you know, a, a label Sony or whoever calls them and says, man, you're killing it. We want to give you a record deal. And I go, why? Why do I want to give you my masters, man? I own everything. I don't know how long this is going to last, but I, I know what I'm doing right now. And, and it's, it's going well. And so, uh, that's, the, the, you know, I, I think the, if that were to happen to me, I think the, even as long as I've been in the music industry, I think my, my biggest thing would be, well, okay. okay if I'm getting this amount of streams per month and they're offering me this deal, yeah, I'm getting a million per month, but how, how do I continue that and how do I manage it and how do I get everything that I can get out of this? So tour dates and merch and, you know, music videos and, you know, further distribution and better promotion, uh, radio promotion, all these things. Like it's at some point it, you get to the point where you kind of build, you'd have to build a label around you because you need somebody that's doing merch. If you're doing that well, you, you're going to need somebody doing your merch. You're probably going to need a tour manager. You're going to need an agent. You're going to need somebody to do promotions. You're going to need somebody that's going to help with, you know, social media, you know, all these different things. So I don't know, man, maybe you do sign with a label hmm. and you hope that you've got enough leverage to say, you're not taking all of my masters. I'll give you X amount. I'll give you this percentage. You know, and you can do distribution and promotion, but I'm going to keep these other things and I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep this share of the masters. So it's just, a, it's, it's kind of a difficult, it, it's, it's a difficult place to be kind of for everybody. Um, but at the end of the day, it is still a business. And, I, you know, if somebody throws enough money at you, you're eventually going to cave, I guess, you know. But I think you made <laughs> it really excellent. I mean, you made an excellent point when you put it from the perspective of you do a one heat wonder, you, you you have five million, whatever million view. First of all, you gotta see like, can I monetize that? And yeah. wh where are where are the money? You know, is it like in the click that I get from YouTube? Because a lot of people look at the ads, and then yeah. when this is over, what am I gonna do? Or right. are you gonna really do it? seriously and then that money is going to have to come out from your pocket no matter what so you either get you give away a percentage or you're going to have to create your entire structure for yourself which yeah when you look at that way you may want to focus on writing your stuff right and get yeah. a deal probably i don't know i'd be happy to know other people will think about this and put some comments, <laughs> you know, other yeah, 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 yeah. That are out there. but yeah, you made a really good point. Listen, I, I could keep talking forever because I, I love the topic and, and I'd like to hear your story, but I want to give you an opportunity before you, we hand this conversation and you're more than welcome to come back anytime. And we keep, keep going with, I, I love to have recurring guests because I feel like I already know them a little bit. So yeah, the yeah. conversation become even easier. But what what are you up now in this day? Um, what's your latest thing? What are you doing? Are you touring? Are you? Yeah, so I've, I have been traveling. I have been playing. I was just uh, recently did a few shows in Virginia and in North Carolina. And um, uh, gosh, Marco, what am I doing next? CMA <laughs> Awards. Yeah, the CMA Awards are, are next week in Nashville. So I'm looking forward to that. Cool. Um, they uh, were taking my mom. This year, she's never been to the CMA Awards. 
So we're going to take her. She actually just texted me at the the beginning of uh, our conversation, and <laughs> she's excited because Post Malone's going to be there. She loves Post Malone. Uh, great. And, uh, yeah. I do too. So he's it's going to be fun, man. It's going to be a good time. Uh, new album came out in the summer. It's a it's an EP. Uh, there's six or seven songs on there. I don't remember how many, but um, I, I'd love for everyone to check it out. I'm really proud of this work, and you know I. I wrote songs for so many years for other people and I got really comfortable with that. And, and finally, you know, last year I just decided, man, it's been too long. I've, you know, everybody else is singing my stuff. I, I've still got things I want to say myself. And so I started putting out some music and, and there's going to be more music coming out uh, really soon. But uh, for all things Drew Ryder Smith, you can just go to DrewRyderSmith.com. And all the social links are there and YouTube links, things like that. Yeah, and we'll put it on the notes for this podcast or under YouTube, the video. Right. I, I will put all the links to your stuff because I want people to get in touch with you. And sure. if they don't know you yet, they can learn more about you and discover your music. So I yeah, I enjoy yeah. this, uh, this journey into your career and yeah. uh, your honesty. I mean, really, you know, it, it was definitely not a script conversation. <laughs> we didn't even have to, like bullet point, which is the way I like it. And sure. uh, and I'm glad uh, I'm glad you stopped by and, and share your story. So. Yeah, Marco, thank you so much, man. I'm, I'm really grateful to you for having me. Cool. All right, everybody here. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Subscribe to my podcast. Uh, get connected and in touch with Drew here. And uh, stay tuned. There'll be more stories coming on on our Audio Senior podcast about stories, storytelling, and storytellers. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Audio Signals with Marco Ciappelli. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand to our conversations and our audience, visit itspmagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our shows. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey.